In this video tutorial, I'm creating a tart, which you can simplify because it does have quite a few steps. We have a spice pastry tart shell, which is lined with a gold chocolate and caramelized almond coating. We're then topping that with a lemon jelly, lemon cake, caramel custard, then it's topped with a gold chocolate mousse, which has a clear caramel glaze. Then we're gonna finish it off with a garnish of caramelized almonds and caramel. This tart is one of our video tutorials from Saver Online Classes. Our video tutorials is a subscription-based platform in which we have over 330 videos. You can also download and print every recipe. So this will give you an insight into the style of product that we do, but we also have guest chefs on the platform from all around the world. So to have unlimited access, you can subscribe to Saver Online Classes. I'm sure you'll enjoy the demonstration. Now I'm using an unsalted butter so I can control the amount of salt that I add. One of the most important things when you're creating pastry is to ensure that you have no lumps of butter. I'm gonna add in the brown sugar. Now I'm gonna beat these together until it's completely smooth and I know I've got no more lumps of butter before I add in the egg. Now I've eliminated all lumps of butter from the mixture, which the brown sugar is great for because you can still see the butter. You don't need to aerate it at this stage, we're just combining the ingredients. I'm going to add in the egg. Now it may split and separate at this stage, but it doesn't matter because we're not relying on any air that we've incorporated into the butter and sugar. I'm going to incorporate all of the dry ingredients. So I have here some gingerbread spice. It's also known as Liebkuchen spice. So I'm going to add that in. If you don't have that, you can replace it with nutmeg, some ground cinnamon, salt, baking powder. Now what the baking powder is going to do is it's going to lighten the pastry slightly. So it makes it much easier when you're cutting the tart. Still going to get a crunchy texture, but a little bit lighter. Adding all the dry ingredients in. Now, once you add the flour, this is another point when you're making pastry, shortbread pastry, is to not overwork it once the flour is incorporated. If you do start to overwork the flour, you will develop the gluten, which can make the pastry, once you've got it in the casing, shrink a little bit. So we're just going to mix it until all the flours combine and then stop. All the flour is now fully combined. I'm going to press the pastry now into a flat and even square so that it can chill in the fridge. It needs to stay in the fridge for approximately an hour before rolling out. Make sure you press it out evenly to ensure that you don't have some firm pastry and some soft because that's when it cracks during the rolling out process. Wrap it up now and it's going to go into the fridge for approximately an hour before I roll it out. I have some pastry here that I prepared earlier that's been in the fridge actually overnight. So I'm going to roll this out. If it's a little bit firm when you pull it out of the fridge, just let it sit at room temperature for maybe two to three minutes before you start rolling it out. Now this pastry will actually make two tart shells. So I'm going to cut a small amount off any scraps I get from the first roll, I'm going to combine back with the dough that I haven't rolled out yet to roll it out for my second tart shell. I'm going to place this back in the fridge until I'm ready to roll the second one. I'm using an all-purpose or a plain flour. I'm going to lightly dust the surface of the table. Place the pastry down. Always think when you initially roll the dough out, particularly if you're doing it by hand, that you need to put a little bit of extra flour but then you don't need to add more through the rolling out process. I'm going to roll this to about three millimetres in thickness. Every few rolls, just pick it up to ensure it's not sticking to the bench. So 
Some people, when they're lining tart shells, do it in two pieces. They do the sides and the base separately. I like to do it all in one go. That's about the thickness we're looking for. The tart ring I'm using is actually a perforated tart ring. What this does is it allows air to travel between the pastry and the tart ring. Often when we line tart rings, if it's a solid tart ring, we can trap air between the pastry and the tart ring itself. When we heat the air, the air expands in the oven and it can create a cavity on the outside of the shell. So what this actually does is it allows air to travel through so we can get a completely solid and very clean edge on the tarts. I've combined that with a perforated tray which allows air to travel through the base and this is called a silpane mat which once again allows air to travel through. So it means that all sides of our tart are going to be really flat. I'm going to use the tart ring as a guide to cut out the pastry. So I'm just trimming it slightly larger than the tart ring. Now this leftover pastry is what I'm going to combine with my remaining pastry. Don't work it too much. Press it into a flat disc and we're going to combine it with the remaining leftover pastry. Place a tart ring back onto the tray and we lift the pastry up. Drop it into the tart ring and then just gently push it into the corners. Now I've gently pressed it into the corners but I can see that the corners are actually rounded. So if I trim the top of the tart now, when the pastry actually bakes, it's going to slide down to actually fill in this corner. So to ensure that that doesn't happen, I have to push the pastry right into the corner to do that. I lift up the ring slightly and press the pastry down so that we really tuck it right into that corner. And I go the whole way around and repeat that process. If the pastry feels a little bit soft at this stage, I would place it into the fridge for 20 minutes, but still feels firm enough, then you can simply trim it using a small knife and make sure you don't angle the knife, keep the knife straight up and down. We're just going to trim off the excess pastry. We're going to place the tart back into the fridge for 10 minutes before lining it so it's ready to bake. I'm going to line my tart with cling wrap and some rice. Now this cling wrap is actually heat proof. So the brand I have in Australia is OSO, but not all cling wrap is heat proof. So you will have to test it first. Cut a large enough square so that you can wrap it over the top of the rice and fill the tart and make sure it goes right into the corners with the rice. Just pat it down. Then we wrap the plastic. When you wrap the plastic in, make sure you don't pull the rice in so it's still supporting the sides. So I just loosely wrap it. The plastic will shrink once it goes into the oven a little bit. If you don't have heat proof plastic wrap, you're going to use some baking paper or parchment paper. Because it's silicon coated, you need to crush it a few times. Spread it out, crush it again, and cut a disc that's about 10 to 15 centimetres bigger than the tart. Press it into the tart. Your tart, if you're using parchment paper or baking paper, must be really cold. Otherwise, the paper is going to make indents into the pastry. Then you're going to do exactly the same thing with the rice. I'm going to bake this in a fan-forced oven at 170 degrees Celsius. After the first lot of baking time, you're going to remove the rice. Then you're going to continue baking for a further five minutes or so until it's a nice golden brown color. Now the tart is fully baked, but it's still hot. It's important with these type of rings, because we don't grease it, that you actually release it from the ring before it cools down. So I'm just running the knife very gently around the top. And just ensure that it's releasing, which it is, but keep it on. 
So keep it on while it's cooling so the pastry doesn't change shape at all, but you must release this ring while it's still hot. I'm creating some caramelised almonds, which are going to be used for a few different elements within the tart. Now you can do this technique with any nut. I'm going to place water in the saucepan first, followed by sugar. I'm going to cook that together to 114 degrees Celsius. I have roasted the almonds here and they're still warm. The sugar and water mixture we can stir until it starts to boil. Once it starts boiling, you can't stir it because the agitation will cause the sugar to prematurely crystallize. I've reached 114 degrees, so now I'm gonna add in the warm almonds. So the idea of this is to actually coat the almonds in the sugar, so we get a more even caramelization, and the caramel will actually individually coat the nuts. Where if I created a caramel and added the nuts in, be very, very difficult to ensure that all the almonds were completely coated in the caramel. So I'll stop talking and start stirring because what I have to do now is recrystallize the sugar. So agitate it, which is really a no-no when you're trying to boil the sugar and water normally, to recreate the sugar crystals. So you can see that they're starting up there. So the heat is off and I'm just agitating it till all the sugar recrystallizes. And you'll notice that it's coating the almonds beautifully. Any of the nuts that are joined, just ensure that they're separated. And I'm going to pour this, once it's ready, directly onto a Silpat mat, which is this non-stick baking mat. So I've got that ready for when the nuts are caramelized. Now that I've coated them all in sugar, I'm gonna turn the heat back on. You need to manage the heat because it's important that all the sugar is completely dissolved and fully caramelized before you pour it out onto the mat. So if the sugar's going too quickly, it will burn before you've dissolved all the sugar. So just manage the heat, I would say on a medium heat, until all the sugar is fully dissolved and caramelized. Now that we've turned the heat back on, don't stir it too quickly because that can cause the sugar to recrystallize. So just gently stirring to ensure that all the sugar melts evenly. All the sugar's dissolved and fully caramelized. I'm going to add some butter in now, some unsalted butter, which will help to stop the sugar recrystallizing. So just stir that through. Pour it out immediately onto the Silpat mat. Now I need to separate some to use as garnishes. So take a few of the nicer almonds and we're gonna separate them individually. The others, it doesn't matter if it's in a cluster because we can still chop it up. The aroma in this room is absolutely beautiful. They smell divine. I think if I was selling my house, I'd do a batch of these just before open for inspection. I have enough individual almonds now for garnishing. What I'm gonna do is let this cool at room temperature. As soon as it's cool, you need to place it in an airtight container and you can freeze it. So you can freeze it for a couple of months before use. I'm creating the crunch layer, which will have two applications in the tart. Now, the base of this recipe is a Calabar gold chocolate, which is one of my favorites. Now, it's a white chocolate with roasted milk powder. 2% of the sugar is caramelized and it has salt added to it as well. The flavor is absolutely beautiful. And even though it's a white chocolate, that roasting of the milk powder, which caramelizes the milk proteins, really changes the flavor profile. So it's really quite caramely without being overly sweet. So I'm gonna combine that in a bowl. I recommend you use plastic. I'm using glass so you can see what I'm doing. I've got some of the Calabar almond praline paste here, which is 50% caramelized sugar, 50% almonds. And it's made exactly the same way that we made the caramelized almonds. So you can use the same process if you wanted to make your own. 
but it's very difficult to get it as smooth as the commercial product is. You can put it in a food processor, but it can't get hot at any stage, so you'll have to freeze it in between to ensure it stays cool. Now I'm gonna scrape that in. I'm gonna melt this in the microwave in 30 second increments until I've got half liquid, half solid chocolate, then I'm going to return it back to the bench and vigorously stir it. Now I've got approximately half half, so I'm just gonna stir this and this is going to temper it. The problem with working with glass is it retains too much heat, which is why I recommend that you use plastic. So the chocolate is now tempered. We've put the praline paste in there so it has a softer set, so it's not going to be as rigid. If it is really firm and we've just got the chocolate, when we go to cut the tart, it makes it very challenging. So the praline paste will actually soften that a little bit. I've got the caramelized almonds that we've made, a small portion of that, which are finely chopped and that is completely cool. Now you can really add any sort of dry ingredients into this recipe. I've got some rice bubbles, or they're also referred to as puff rice or rice krispies, and some cinnamon. We stir this through and make sure that all the nuts and the rice bubbles are completely coated. I'm going to use a portion of this mixture to actually seal the tart so that when we put the lemon jelly in, it doesn't soften the pastry at all. Just spreading that around with a palette knife. Make sure it's a really thin layer. And make sure that the base is completely coated. This is going to help to seal the tart when we put the lemon jelly in to ensure that the pastry doesn't become soft. You can leave that at room temperature to set if your room temperature is not too warm or you can place it into the fridge for a few minutes. The remaining chocolate I'm going to spread onto a Silpat mat and spread it out and we're going to use this as part of our garnish. You can roll this between two Silpat mats but I want the surface of this to be quite rough and not even at all but we still need it to be quite thin. Give it a little bit of a tap. I'm gonna leave this at room temperature to set before cutting it up. The remainder has set, so I'm going to cut out some garnishes. You can simply cut this with a knife. If you're going to use a knife, you will have to remove it from the silpat mat. But I'm using a piping tip or a piping tube to just to create some little squares. I'm also going to create some small rounds and these are to garnish the top of the tart with. Now, once you make these, these can be stored at room temperature. As long as your room temperature is not above 23 degrees Celsius, they can be stored for up to, I'd say four or five months, just in an airtight container. I'm going to cut a few rounds. Because this contains no water, if you're making it in a large quantity, any remaining chocolate that you have, you can re-temper and re-spread out and go again. Or you can just eat it. Creating the lemon jelly, we're going to pre-soak the gelatin in some chilled water. I do have a great tutorial on online classes about how to interchange gelatin, which you can have a look at our online classes library to see all the details. You want to soak the gelatin just until it becomes pliable. For the lemon jelly, I'm using a lemon puree. You can also just use lemon juice. You'll see the puree isn't as clear as a lemon juice, which is fine. Now this has got no sugar added to it in the puree. Now some purees are already pasteurized and some are not. The one I'm using is a ravi fruit frozen puree from France and it's not pasteurized, so I must boil it. If you're using a puree that is pasteurized, you don't have to heat up the full amount of the puree, just enough to dissolve the sugar. I'm gonna add the sugar in. I'm gonna bring that up to a boil. Now 
That's come to a boil now, so I've turned the heat off. I'm going to let it cool to 80 degrees Celsius before adding in the pre-soaked gelatin. So you can see the gelatin is nice and pliable. If we add the gelatin in above 80 degrees Celsius, what we're going to do is start creating a Maillard reaction, which can start to brown the proteins in the gelatin, change the color and change the flavor. But also over 80 degrees, it can also reduce the gelatin's setting ability. Stir that through until it's melted. Now this is quite tart because we've got quite a lot of sweetness in the other components of the tart. So I didn't want anything that was too sweet. I'm transferring the jelly mixture to a jug so it can cool down. We need this to cool down to 29 to 30 degrees Celsius before we pour it over our gold chocolate crunch layer. The lemon jelly has cooled to 28 degrees Celsius so I can place it on top of our chocolate here. Now it just needs to be a thin layer because we've still got a few elements to go into the tart. I'm now going to place this into the freezer. You can certainly simplify this tart. I'm doing a lemon cake which is going to go on top of the lemon jelly. If you wanted to, you could top the lemon jelly directly with the chocolate mousse and leave this cake layer out, but I do love it. I'm going to combine sugar and some freshly zested lemons. I'm going to mix these two together before adding in the eggs. Adding in the eggs. I'm going to increase the speed on the mixer and I'm going to whip that up until the eggs become pale in colour and the mixture is aerated. I've warmed up some fresh cream and I'm just going to drizzle that in while it's mixing. This is the consistency we're looking for. We'll remove all the lemon from the whisk. I'm going to set that aside and sieve the dry ingredients. So I have some all purpose or plain flour, baking powder, and I'm going to quickly sieve that. We're going to place in some of the dry ingredients and fold it through, so just a little bit at a time. This is where it's handy to have two people. So try to retain as much air as you can while you're folding the dry ingredients through. Just adding it in parts where if you've got a special friend that can help you, they can add it in continuously as you're folding it through. Once you've mixed all the dry ingredients through, I'm going to take a little bit of the batter and add it into the butter. The butter is melted, but it's very liquid. So if I pour the butter in, it's just going to run to the bottom of the bowl. So to ensure that it mixes in well without knocking out all the air, I'm bringing it to a similar consistency as the batter before folding it through. I'm just going to mix that together. Gently folding that through. We're going to repeat the same with the lemon juice. So a little bit of the batter in. Fold that through. This is actually a beautiful baked cake. So if you're wanting just to make this element on its own, I highly recommend it. I'm going to deposit this into what we call a flexi pan mold, which is a disc, which I'm going to place into the tart on top of the jelly. So this has baking powder in it and we have aerated the eggs and sugar. So it is going to rise during baking. So it's going to approximately double in height and we don't want it to take up too much space in the tart. So keep that in mind when you're filling up your mold. If you haven't got one of these flexi pan molds, you can simply bake this in a cake ring and then you can trim it because it's difficult to mix less of the cake mixture, so you will have a little bit left over, but these can certainly stay in the freezer for up to two months. I'm gonna bake these in the oven at 170 degrees Celsius.
Now this is an optional extra. This is purely just for the garnish. So I won't judge if you don't want to make this step, but it's also fantastic if you wanted to make beautiful caramel squares. So there is another use for this recipe. It's a beautiful chewy caramel that I'm going to utilize on the top of the cake as a garnish. So to make this caramel, which I'm sure you're going to do, we're going to place water, sugar, it really doesn't matter of the particle size of the sugar you're using for this recipe, whether it's a granulated or a finer sugar. And glucose. I recommend you warm up the glucose a little bit before you use it. So the warmed glucose goes in. I'm going to heat this up to 145 degrees Celsius. Now at this stage we can stir it, but once it starts boiling you can't stir it until we add in the other ingredients, then we must stir it. I'm just stirring it at the start to ensure that there's no sugar stuck on the bottom because that can caramelize. If you've got any undissolved sugar crystals once it starts boiling on the side of the pot, you can wash them down with a clean brush and water. I've boiled the cream and vanilla. You have to keep that hot so when you add it in, it's closer to the temperature of the sugar mixture. Keep the sugar boiling. I've boiled the cream and vanilla. I'm going to pour that in. Just have a larger pot because it can boil up. I'm going to add in some unsalted butter, some honey. So honey is an inverted sugar. If you don't want to have the honey flavor, you can use inverted sugar in replacement of the honey. What the honey and the inverted sugar is going to do is it's going to retain the moisture within the caramel and slow down the evaporation of moisture, therefore giving you a longer shelf life. I'm going to add in some salt. Once all the butter's melted, we're going to add in the bicarb soda. We're going to take this now to 119 degrees. Don't have it on too high a heat because it can catch on the bottom of the pot. What the bicarb soda does is it actually makes it a richer, darker caramel colour. It also helps us homogenize or combine and emulsify the fat and the water together because we added quite a bit of butter there. It helps bring those two properties together and bind them. It is alkaline, so you have to be careful how much you actually add in there. But it does catch very easily on the bottom of the pot. Be very vigilant if it's starting to go too quickly, just lower the temperature a little bit. So the temperature that we take this to is going to determine the consistency of the caramel. If we take it lower than 119 degrees Celsius, it's going to be a softer caramel, but it wouldn't hold if we cut it into cubes. If we take it higher than 119, we can probably only go as high as 121 and still be able to cut it. Any higher than that, it's going to be brittle and difficult to cut. Pour it directly into a mould or frames. Just be mindful if you're using a metal mould, it may buckle. Try not to give it too much movement because you can crystallise it at this stage. We did put glucose in at the start, which helps to stop the sugar once we've dissolved it, reforming as a crystal. Now I've used these food grade plastic frames. This is nine millimeters high. So I've used three frames and they're three millimeters high each. If you don't have these frames, you can just use another mold, but make sure you line it with baking paper. Once the caramel is cool, we can remove it from the frames and I'm going to dice it into individual cubes. I have this on a lined board because the caramel will stick to a board. Alternately, you can actually oil the board to avoid it sticking. I'm going to lightly oil a knife. Consistency is so good. You don't actually need that much for the tart, so the rest is for you. You're welcome. I'm creating a gold chocolate mousse. Now this is a simple recipe. It doesn't have eggs in it. So quite often I'm asked for an egg-free chocolate mousse recipe. This is it. Obviously the other elements in this recipe do have eggs, but if you wanted to make this on its own, perfect. I have some gelatin, which I'm going to pre-soak in water. 
If you don't want to add gelatin to this recipe, you could actually add macrya, which is a cocoa butter, powdered cocoa butter to the chocolate. It's a Calabart product. And that will actually give you more setting capacity without the sweetness. The only thing with using Macrya as a setting agent is a product needs to be served straight from the fridge. It can't sit out on display because cocoa butter melts at such a low temperature, it would soften quite quickly. So I'm just soaking the gelatin. Now in a saucepan, I'm gonna place water, sugar, some glucose that I've heated in the microwave, now the glucose is going to help to stop the sugar recrystallizing after we've dissolved it. Glucose is a sugar derived from wheat, but it doesn't have any gluten in it. It's 40% less sweet than sucrose. I have a little bit of sea salt here that I'm going to add into the syrup. Just crush it up a little bit. And all we're trying to do here with the syrup is simply dissolve the sugar. You don't need to boil it for any period of time because then you're going to evaporate water and change the consistency of the syrup. All the sugar is dissolved. I'm going to turn the syrup off. I'm going to cool it down to below 80 degrees Celsius before adding in the gelatin. Adding in the gelatin. Pour the syrup over the Calabart gold chocolate. We're going to whisk it together to create a ganache. I already have a recipe on online classes for this exact recipe in a dark chocolate mousse. With the dark chocolate mousse, I don't add any gelatin, but if you go to the search function in our library and type in chocolate mousse, it will come up. Now gelatin will start to set at 28 degrees Celsius and below. So we need to fold this through some semi-whipped cream, which I've set aside in the fridge, before it drops below 28 degrees. But we also don't want to fold it through the cream when it's too warm or else it's going to melt the butter in the cream. We're going to lose all that air. So I'm going to cool this down on an ice bath to 32 degrees Celsius. These are very similar in consistency now that our mousse base has cooled down. I've got some semi-whipped cream here. The consistency we want is that it's aerated, but it will still collapse and drip off a spoon. So I'm going to add a small amount to start and just gently fold it through. Now I'm just going to fold in the remainder of the cream. Once you've added all the cream, because the cream's chilled, you will need to apply it to your mold fairly quickly before it starts to set. So we're folding it through, maintaining as much air as we possibly can while we're completing this process. Once all the ingredients are combined, you need to stop mixing. If you continue to mix once they're combined, you can separate the cream. I'm using a silicon mold to create the mousse to sit on top of the tart. This does come as a kit with the mold base. Alternately, if you don't have a silicon mold, you can mold this in a ring, freeze it as I'm going to in the mold, and then we're going to glaze it and place it on top. Just cut a small amount off the end of the bag. Pipe in around the edges first. And apply quite a bit of pressure, which will help to avoid getting any air bubbles. Now, if it needs it, you can just level it off with a pellet knife. This is now going to go into the freezer. This will need at least four to six hours in the freezer before it's unmolded. If you're fortunate enough to have a blast freezer, it'll take about 20 minutes. This is a lemon cake which has been baked and I've frozen it. I'm going to trim this slightly to place it in so we have a little bit of space to put some mousse on top. So I'm using a serrated edge knife to trim it. And what I do is I just mark it around first. So it's the same level the whole way around. And then each time I go around, I go in a little bit further. This is a lemon cake piece we're using, so just a really thin layer just on top. The remainder we can place back into the freezer. I'm going to pipe the remainder of our gold chocolate mousse on top, piping around the edge to start.
Now I'm going to take the mixture from the centre and bring it to the edge so it's completely level and then just wipe off the excess. You can place this tart into the freezer at this stage. It can stay in the freezer for up to six weeks or you can place it in the fridge at this stage if you're going to serve it within 24 hours. We're creating the glaze, which is a transparent glaze. I'm going to caramelise sugar. Before I start the sugar off, I'm going to pre-soak the gelatin in a bowl of cold water. Just put in one sheet at a time. If you put the whole lot in, it'll take a very long time for the water to get through to the centre. To dry caramelise the sugar, you can do it in stages and if you're doing a really large quantity, I recommend you put a little bit of sorbitol powder in the base of the pot. Melt that first before putting your sugar in, which will help to avoid you burning the sugar. I'm going to stir this slowly once I turn the stove on and ensure that I don't agitate it too much, which will cause the sugar to recrystallise. Now all the sugar must be completely dissolved and caramelised and then we're going to stop it cooking by adding in the water. The sugar's fully dissolved and caramelised, so I'm going to deglaze it by adding in the water. Adding in the warm glucose. I'm going to add in the neutral glaze and bring it to 103 degrees Celsius. So the neutral glaze is pectin based. If you can't get the neutral glaze, you can use a clear apricot jam, so one that doesn't really have a lot of fruit or you can also use what's called an apage in equal weights to what I've added with the neutral glaze. We also have a neutral glaze recipe in our online classes video library. We've reached 103 degrees. Just ensure that all the neutral glaze is fully dissolved. There'll be enough residual heat there to dissolve any remaining neutral glaze. You may just need to stir it gently while it dissolves. We're gonna cool this down to 80 degrees Celsius before adding in the pre-soaked gelatin. Now this glaze is best made and used on the same day. You can actually store it, but I always find you do incorporate a little bit of air when you reheat it. The base of the glaze is cooled down, so I'm going to add in the gelatin. It's quite a bit of gelatin. So we are using mainly gelatin to set the glaze. We have a little bit of pectin in the neutral glaze. Now if you're using lots of gelatin, I highly recommend you create a gelatin solution or a gelatin mass, which you can find a video for in our online library. Just gently stir the gelatin through. This is a stage that you really don't want to incorporate any air. I am going to transfer it through to another bowl. We're going to work with this at approximately 35 degrees Celsius. Just transferring it through to a bowl. Going to place plastic wrap on the surface so it doesn't get a skin while it cools down. I'm just going to cool it down at room temperature. We have lots of different glazes available in our online classes library. Find lots of different glazes that would be perfect for this recipe. We're ready for glazing, so I have the wire rack placed on a flexi pad, or you can put a tray underneath to catch all the excess glaze. If you take your caramel mousse disc out of the freezer and it has any ice or condensation, just ensure that you wipe that off before you put the glaze on. Otherwise, that layer of moisture between the glaze and the mousse will make the glaze actually slide off or be patchy. I've transferred the glaze to a jug to make it easier to pour on. The plastic wrap that's on the surface of the glaze, don't try and squeeze it out because you're just going to add air bubbles to the glaze. Now this glaze is best used on the day that it's made, so just make small enough quantities that you're not going to have a lot of excess. If you do have excess, always recommend keep it in the fridge or the freezer and use a little bit of that to add to fresh glaze. The glaze is 35 degrees Celsius. You could probably go as low as say 33 degrees, but no lower and no higher. Otherwise, when you pour the glaze on, you're going to get holes in the glaze. It's not going to give you a complete coating. We're going to wipe off the excess glaze with a palette knife. If you're not confident or you haven't done this before, I recommend that you practice this a few times before you actually put the glaze on itself. And the mistake that most people make is when they come to the end, they actually bring the palette knife down, so ensure that you keep going straight across. It's almost like an aerobic movement. Pour the glaze over in a large quantity, don't drizzle it on.
and then we just gently wipe off the excess just on a slight angle So we leave that to sit until it stops dripping and then we're going to lift it up while it's still frozen and cut off any excess drips before placing it onto our tart. It's important to pick the mousse up while it's still frozen so just with a small knife pick it up underneath and just cut off any excess glaze. We line the mousse up, place it into position, centre it and only then drop the knife down and just slide it out. This is a gold chocolate Chantilly cream, which is absolutely beautiful. It's otherwise known as a whipped ganache. You can interchange the gold chocolate with white chocolate ruby chocolate and milk chocolate. We have two lots of cream. We're going to boil the first lot of cream together with some glucose and some vanilla bean paste. I'm going to bring that up to a boil. Once it boils, pour it over the gold chocolate. I'm going to whisk that together. The second group of cream, which is the largest group, is cold. We add that in. So the first group was just to melt the chocolate. With this Chantilly cream, we've got a lot more fat in it than you would normally have in cream. So that's why it needs to sit in the fridge for four to six hours or even overnight to ensure that that fat can re-solidify before you whip it up. I have the Chantilly cream, which has been chilled overnight in the mixing bowl. Now this doesn't take as long to whip as normal cream, so I wouldn't step away from the mixer. Perfect consistency there, that's exactly what you're looking for. So just a little bit of movement on the end. Height the Chantilly cream, I'm using what we call a Saint Honoré nozzle, so it's typical to have the V shape here. So you can see the consistency of the cream, even though it's whipped, it does still have a little bit of movement. You don't want it to be too firm when you're piping, otherwise you can overwork the cream. If you haven't piped with the Saint Honoré nozzle before, I suggest you do a little bit of practice. The biggest tip I can give you is when you're actually piping with the Saint Honoré, is that the nozzle itself needs to sit flat. So if you slightly raise it, I'm going to pop on the bench just to show you. So if I sit it completely flat and have a look if I angle it slightly, I get that large amount on the base there. So it's always important that the nozzle, or you can call it a piping tip, actually sits completely flush and flat with the product. The other tip I can give you is as you're going, if you get a buildup of cream here, you should clean it off as you go. So just wipe that so it's clean before you actually start because that part of the cream is going to end up on your product. We're going to angle it slightly as we pipe, so piping in. Now for the garnishes, we have created elements here. These two are fine because they're already part of the tart. The caramel, I won't judge if you don't make it because we're only actually adding a few squares to the actual tart. Although I must say in its defense, it is beautiful to eat as a confection cut into squares. So what I'm gonna do now is create a line of garnishes just off to the side. I've oiled the tweezers because you will leave fingerprints on the caramel if you actually touch it. So this is the chopped caramelized almond. I like putting a little bit of a cluster of this. We've just got our chocolate crunch layer. For the chopped almonds, um, they will stick together fairly quickly. As I said, you can store these in the freezer. If they're not sticking together, leave the bowl open for about 20 minutes and the caramel will actually start to dissolve. And that makes some really nice um, joined clusters. I think the texture of this works really well because we've got very clean lines and we've got a nice shiny smooth glaze. So the contrast 
of these textural products for me work really well. So with all my recipes, you can certainly simplify them and you don't have to do as many elements as I have, but you can also utilize our video library and take elements from different products, mix them together to incorporate and create your own design and final products. For today, here we have my finished lemon and gold chocolate tart. I hope you've enjoyed my demonstration for the Virtual Pastry Summit. If you like my tutorial, you're going to love Saver Online Classes. We add a new tutorial to the library weekly. You have unlimited access. And if you like my style, my explanations, you can learn so much more. We also have an online community that's exclusive to our subscribers. For more information about Saver Online Classes, you can visit our website at saverschool.com.au.